Hey everyone and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well greetings and salutations everybody, welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and I can't say why, but all the girlies were all a flutter yesterday because... <sighs> Uh, what's their name? Nick Carter and Lance Bass. Lance John. Bass were in our studios yesterday, oh. but I can't say why. <laughs> also, here is Christian Harloff. I thought you were going to say because of Mark Ellis was here. It, it's, <laughs> it's very nice to ha- see that Clark Kent was recast as a woman. Oh, 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 oh. Also, here is I just got that the second time I left. Nice. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Yeah, she's wearing glasses, everybody. <laughs> All Be right, when make you brush fun your of teeth, the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Hi, that's me. <laughs> Once again, behind the scenes chatter that you guys won't get. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, as sometimes happens, after we get the show notes done, another item in, in the world of movies drops, and we got the new Hunger Games Mocking Jay Part 2 trailer drop. Now, actually, I saw this. I didn't see it at Comic Con. They did play this at Comic Con. I saw it yesterday in front of an Ant Man screening in a theater, and it looked pretty damn good on the AMC Prime screen. I gotta say, it looked awesome. But anyway, the new trailer just dropped. Christian, you had a chance to take a look at it. What do you think about the new trailer? Well, you just got to see it yesterday. Mark saw it at Comic-Con. I saw it 10 minutes ago, um, <laughs> and I loved it. I really did. I And I've mentioned this every single time we talk about Hunger Games, that I, I was a fan of the books, and I really did. I know that you, I think the three of us are kind of the minority to where I really enjoyed Mockingjay Part 1 a lot. I thought it was a great setup to what this movie was going to be, and that's epic, and this trailer looked epic. Everything about it, what I did like about it, and I might be wrong. The people who read the books can scream at me about it, but I th- I don't remember the Mocking Jay part. Well, the book being about the Hunger Games and making the capital into a Hunger Games type event. It was just raid the capital, do what we have to do. I like the new addition of adding a Hunger Games element to it. It it, it kind of ties the whole movie story together. So I like that. I I like that they're also acknowledging to where you got to kill Snow. That's where it ends. Kill Snow, and that's the mission. It's an assassination plot. I'm on board. Yeah, if I if I remember correctly, because I did read the book, but it was a while ago now, and I only read it once. I do believe that. I don't know if he refers to it as a Hunger Games type of situation, but I know Snow just litters the capital right. with those elaborate booby trap sort of things. So it kind of plays out like Hunger Games, but I don't know if they go so overtly into it in the books like they did in the trailer. I love that. And you're right. That, yeah. It does feel like it brings everything full circle. I thought this was a spectacular trailer, and I also really liked part one. It was not what... You know, the other films have been, it is not action centric, it is not any of that, but I just felt it was really well, just a well done movie. Really well set up, a different kind of movie than the first two Hunger Games movies were, but I appreciated it for what it was. But this movie looks like it's just gonna be just spectacular. Like a lot of high octane action. This is now all the payoff. The three movies we've we've watched, the three movies we've even experienced, this is now going to be the payoff. And it looks like they're doing it right. It really does. Yeah. And Look, for those of you who read the book, there's a very heart-crushing moment in the trailer. You know what? If you've read the book, you know exactly what the moment is I'm talking about. But I love the trailer myself. Mark, what do you think? Well, you know, I've had a week and a half to think about my (laughs) thoughts on the trailer. So excuse me if they're a little more eloquent than what you guys just said. (laughs) This trailer is neat. It's really, really good. This is going to be a war film. It's going to be brutal. It yeah. feels like the second part of the movie that I saw last year. Not just a sequel to The right. Hunger Games, but a perfect companion piece because that was a lot of setup. I enjoyed it, but it was a lot of setup. And then you yeah. feel this, oh, man, this ominous tone of these, these these dark clouds rolling over. And it's going to be when, when all the dust is settled, somebody is going to die. There's going to be a victor now. It's not going to be another movie where, oh, hey, we tried hard and let's regroup and do this. No, we get a winner. We get a loser by the end of this film i didn't read the books i have no idea what's coming i know we're trying to kill snow i know we're attacking the capital who's going to survive who's going to die i bet a lot of people are not going to make it out of this picture alive and that excites me well that's what (laughs) what mark says too as far as i think that a lot of people that maybe didn't like mockingjay part one once they watch this and you watch it as like a full movie will enjoy part one a lot better i think if if this one delivers which i think it will if if part two is amazing and is as epic as it looks like it will be i think people are going to go back rewatch it and go okay I, I I like this one a lot more than I did than I did the first time watching. And, and as a fan of the movies, but haven't read the books, like you just wait for Katniss to step up because even in the last movie, she was reluctant. She didn't want to make that commercial initially, and she's like, "No, I really, I'm not sure about this." No, she is she is solidified as the leader of this resistance now. There's no question who's in charge, and it's Katniss. Um, actually, it's 
President Coin. But what, what this trailer <laughs> really does for me, though, is it did something unexpected for me. Just this trailer made me kind of look at this whole movie franchise a little bit differently. And tell me what you think about this, because I'm watching this trailer, and I'm seeing they set it up, the whole 13 you know, districts are now unified, and they're all marching on the Capitol, and you think, well, the Capitol is screwed. The Capitol is screwed. And then Donald Sutherland's voice comes into the trailer. It's like, oh, Miss Everdeen. And you're like, I, I feel like if you had him tied up with chains, surrounded by eight attack dogs, and had a gun to his head, and he said, I'm going to kill you in a minute, you'd believe it. <laughs> right. And that suddenly took me back for a second. I, I realized, you know, despite the fact that Donald Sutherland does not have a ton of screen time in this movie, when you really think about it, I feel like he is one of the main pieces of glue that holds his entire franchise together. It is that looming, ominous threat of President Snow, as portrayed by Donald Sutherland in these movies and the way he's portrayed him, that has really driven the engine of this story along. And now we come into the trailer and I see, well, it's the 13 districts uniting. It's, it's game over. Oh, and then Snow speaks. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's not. And let's, I really love yeah, it. And, and, and let's not forget, he gets to play a home court game here because they're marching yes. on the Capitol. So I think President Snow pulled a giant Kevin McAllister and has booby traps all <laughs> yeah, over that yeah. place. Not everybody's making it out of this movie alive, kids. Well, he's powerful, and that's the whole thing. And like even even the little scenes of what you see, that one, when they're hiding behind like the wall and those guns are just firing at them, mm -hmm. you're like, like Mark said, it, it's going down. People are they're, both sides are gonna, not going to come out unscathed. Yeah, it looks great. All right, let's get on with our first official topic today. All right, there have been attempts for years to bring a remake of the 1976 sci-fi classic Logan's Run back to the big screen with filmmakers like Bioshock creator Ken Levine, Ryan Gosling with his drive director Nicholas Winding Refn, and Alex Garland all taking shots at it. Now, according to a report in The Hollywood Reporter, X-Men Days of Future Past writer and producer Simon Kinberg is going to be developing a script for the project and will also produce the film as as well. John, would you be down for a Logan's Run remake with Simon Kinberg writing and producing? I would. And one of the most interesting aspects about this story to me would be, you know, who was like for like three full years was really driving to try to get a Logan's Run movie made was X-Men Days of Future Past director Brian Singer was trying forever to get this movie made. And now that we got Pinberg coming, uh, Pinberg. Pinberg. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Pinberg. <laughs> Pinberg. Um, <laughs> now that we have Kinberg writing and producing, which I think is very encouraging to start with, now that we got him, does that maybe open the door for Brian Singer to come back in after he's done with Apocalypse? I mean, I'm, I certainly don't know. The, the original is such a classic in the sense that it's one of those movies like The Godfather where once you watch The Godfather, you suddenly are hit with the reality of how much cinema is influenced by The Godfather. You don't realize until you see The Godfather, and now you look at every movie and you see the fingerprint of The Godfather. Logan's run kind of, not to the same degree, but kind of has that same impact in sci-fi. You know, and actually saw a lot of sci-fi, I know there were a number of like Star Trek things that took directly from their main premise of ageism at a certain age, you gotta die, blah, blah, blah. We've seen that repeated, but there are elements and themes and styles that they did in that movie that you can kind of sense and see the thumbprint in a lot of sci-fi. The original book is a little bit different. Like the original book, which I think came out in like 1967, was a little bit different. I think in the book, the automatic death age was 21. In the movie, I think it was 30. And they had a few other things, but it's a pretty true to the book kind of story. I think a modern retelling is overdue. And I think in Kimberg's hands, I think it could be really cool. So I'm looking forward to it. They've been trying to do this movie for a long time. Yeah. I was well, I worked at I worked for Joel Silver for about three years, and he had it. Joel had this movie, and they had so many different takes and scripts, and they were trying desperately to get it off the ground, and nobody could crack the code. Right. Um, now, with Alex Garland was the guy that I still would like to see Alex Garland direct it, even if it is with a Kinberg script. But Kinberg producing it and writing it, yeah, I mean, he's the guy right now. He's one of the guys. I mean, the other thing, it may open up the door for Brian Singer, but... Who else does he have a lot of contacts through right now? Lucasfilm and yeah. Disney. He's, I mean, he's doing Rebels. He's, he's rumored to be. Oh, he is. He's involved in the Han Solo or Boba Fett, whatever the anthology movie is. He's, right. he writes with Kasdan all the time. So there are a lot of different people that Kinberg could bring to the table to make this happen. And I agree with you. It is time for. I'm not always up for the remakes, but this is one that could use a nice modern retelling. And for a lot of people who have never seen the original or might seem dated to them watching it now. It would serve right, and who better than Kinberg, who knows this world right now? He's he's come up. I, I'm, I want to see what happens with Fantastic Four, even if it turns out to be not good. 
I'm still not going to judge Kinberg off it because of all the other stuff that he's been doing right now, because Days of Future Past and what he's done with Rebels. Um, so yeah, Kinberg on board is a good thing. And you know, I, th I believe Joel Silver is also still attached as a producer oh, is he? on okay. that project. So wow. I think he probably still has the rights wow. to it. Yeah, I mean, it deserves a shot, I think, because of, I, I'm not quite going to say it's, it's like the Godfather science fiction movies, but it did have a lot of influence with you have young rebels that are rising up against an oppressive society. Uh, I mean, we talked about Hunger Games in yeah. the first thing. Yeah. It's, you know, you even see Shades of Logan's Run in something like that. Simon Kinberg is the selling point to me more so than a remake of Logan's Run, because like you guys said, they've been trying to get this thing remade forever, and you, you you, you think about Hollywood, no, there's no more original ideas, which just brings something else back. There's a lot you can do in Logan's Run, but it's not going to be something like when all the Star Trek fans were upset with J.J. Abrams because they, they thought he made more of a Star Wars movie with the first two Star Treks. I don't think you're going to have that problem with Logan's Run. I think you can take, mm. that you can more pick and choose between the source material that you're like, oh yeah, let's keep that and that and that. We can lose that. that that's a little goofy. He's got more freedom to do yeah. that because I think that you do see more silliness in the previous Logan's Run than you do in things like Star Trek, and there's not as many hardcore fans that are going to hold you to the fire if you don't get it exactly right. You can play around in this universe a little bit more, and I think that's what Simon Kimberg uh, excels at. All right, what's next? As many of you know, Pixar is developing a Toy Story 4 movie currently set for release on June 16, 2017. The film is being written by Parks and Recreation star Rashida Jones and Will McCormick and will be directed by none other than John Lasseter himself. Now we hear some movement as Don Rickles, the voice of Mr. Potato Head in the series, has just confirmed that he is returning for the new film. Rickles said the following, They just signed me to do the fourth Toy Story. We start work on it in September and I'm very delighted with that. When John Lasseter approached me for the first one, I said, I don't do comedy with cartoons, dummies, and toys. Leave me alone. And he said, no, you're going to love this. Then he told me the money and how nice it was going to be. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I can give it a try. Mark, is the re-signing of Don Rickles significant to you for a Toy Story 4? It's very significant to me. I'm a huge Don Rickles fan. This is just below getting Tom Hanks and Tim Allen back to be the voices. Like, that's the next guy that I want to hear. I'm not sure that kids are would be able to pick up, oh, no, we need this one back as Mr. Potato Head, but he brings such a magic to this universe for people, I think, of my age and older, that you need this guy back, and that if you start to have characters that were in the first three Toy Stories drop off, you start to think, oh, well, maybe this isn't as important, or they are just mailing it in, or this is just kind of a cash grab for Toy Story 4. The fact that he's coming back, and I know that age would have been a factor because he's getting up there in years, but Rickle still has it, man. I've seen the guy fairly recently. He is still a monster. He should be doing this, and I cannot tell you how happy I am that he's going to be back. He is still one of the funniest human beings alive. Yes, he he is. is the king of roasting people, like mm -hmm. the absolute king of it. And I think this is a significant announcement because, look, we knew that you were going to get Tim Allen and Tom Hanks back, and we knew that. But Don Rickles coming back, I think, kind of sends a signal that we can expect the crew back, that we can expect to see uh, John Rassenberger back as Ham, that we can expect to see Wallace Shawn back as Rex um, or Vincini, you know, whichever one you prefer him as. He'll always be Vincini to me. We, we won't get Jim Varney back, unfortunately, as Slinky, you know, because he departed. But, you know, I thought Blake Clark did a very nice job right. filling in in the next one. So hopefully he'll be back as well. So... I, I'm really encouraged by this, number one, because it's Rickles, and I love hearing Rickles. But number two, I do believe it, it sends up a signal flare that we can expect the full crew to return, and I think that's really exciting. Yeah, when I when the show notes were sent this morning and I read it, I originally read uh, re-signing. Uh, like resigning. Resigning yeah. instead of re-signing. <laughs> and I went, no! Like, no, <laughs> yeah. oh, who are they going to get to do the voice? It's not going to sound the same. And then I went, wait a minute. Oh, oh okay. And that's, that's the reaction I would have had if he didn't come back because he does add such a impact and you guys are absolutely right it's like what it, what it says to me the reason it's significant is that it's like they know we know rickle still got it mm -hmm, like yeah. he's and his humor his timing with comedy timing is everything and you hear it when in his voice and everything he says it's like when when potato head's talking to his wife you're like well yeah that's got to be don rickle so but it, it echoing the point that you made it's it shows everyone's on board the the, the gang's getting back together and we're and and john lasseter the guy who is responsible for all of this is the guy who's directing it now. Yeah, it's very significant, and it's great that Don Rickles is back. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't looked this up. Isn't the voice of Mrs. Potato Head George Costanza's mom in Seinfeld? 
I don't know. So I, I, yeah, I think yeah, that's but, her, right? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not sure if she's still with us, uh, but if she is, then they got to get her back, too, because yeah. they're oh, yeah, yeah. such a good, right. like that old couple that you see arguing at Red Lobster. And Lobster's, I but your you know, angry like, eyes. Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah. So good. It, it's, it's, it's the right. best comedic yeah. part of, that, of those yeah. movies, to me, anyway. And they're so in love, those two. <laughs> 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 All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of Rash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? A short time ago, it was reported that Dwayne The Rock Johnson would be headlining a feature film version of the classic video game Rampage. Now, according to a report in Deadline, it looks like he'll be joined by an old friend on the film, as Johnson San Andreas director Brad Payton is coming on to direct the film as well. The original Rampage put players in control of one of three monsters, a giant ape named George, a giant lizard named Lizzie, or a giant werewolf named Ralph. The game shows the monsters running amok across the United States, fighting the military, and destroying key landmarks. <laughs> Christian Byersell, Brad Payton, joining Dwayne Johnson on Rampage. I'm going to buy it, and I'll tell you why. It's like, was San Andreas the best movie this summer? No. Um, but <laughs> but did it blow up stuff really cool? Did Was there great special effects? Yes. And was Brad Payton responsible for that? Yes. It's very similar to what Pacific Rim was, to where I didn't need to see a whole lot of story and character. I just want to see monsters destroying stuff. Take note, Godzilla. And and have <laughs> I just want to see things blowing up and have the rock running around and saying a couple of cool, you know, quick one liners here and there, quick witted stuff, and then watch the big monsters. And it, it looks like this guy is the guy to do that and has a good chemistry with the rock. And if, if Dwayne Johnson is the one, I want him to do it. I would like to work with him again. I have a good chemistry. Great. I'm on board. Mark? Oh, this is a big buy for me. You watch San Andreas, and what did that movie do well? You're right, Christian. It destroyed everything. You can throw in one giant ape in there, too, and make it look <laughs> even better, ape. especially after watching something like Pixels. You know? Like, it, Pixels, to me, was it, it had such promise to be that movie where you get to see these iconic things from childhood wreck cities. But the humor, to me, in Pixels failed, where this... As long as you get somebody credible to write the script and put in some, it doesn't even have to be believable, but just make me enjoy the humans as much as I enjoy the monsters. They can pull that off. Getting The Rock to star in it is a huge plus for me because The Rock is so likable. Even in something in San Andreas, which didn't have the, the strongest script to it, you like The Rock. You're with that guy. So if you put him in a movie with a giant ape and all the other monsters you're going to see in Rampage, Brad Payton might be the right guy to do this. I'm, I'm actually really excited about this because was San Andreas a great movie? No, but it was a fun movie. It was an entertaining movie, and it did what it set out to do, and The Rock fit really well in there. Adding The Rock now to a movie like, the Ramp, like Rampage, that kind of tells us a little bit about what kind of tone they're going right. for. And remember, this is actually going to be the third film that these two work together on. They work together on Journey, Journey to yeah. Mysterious Island, which made them a truckload of money. Then they did San right. Andreas, and they were able to take kind of a ridiculous concept and a ridiculous script, but kind of make something entertaining worth watching out of it. I think you now bring something like that to Rampagers, I think is tailor-made for these types of guys in this type of chemistry. I think this is a good thing, so for me, it's a buy. <laughs> Can we please get Paul Giamatti in there to be like, yeah. oh my god, it's a giant ape. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I read about this. Like, <laughs> he just hides behind his desk again. The whole <laughs> yeah. Time. Yeah. Who's in danger? I'm a hero. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? Pro basketball player LeBron James has just signed an exclusive deal with Warner Brothers Pictures. The new deal is set to cover everything from film, television, and digital media. Warner Brothers CEO and chairman Kevin Sujahara had this to say about the new deal. LeBron James has one of the most powerful, well-known brands in the world, and we are excited to be in business with him and his partner, Maverick Carter and Spring Hill Entertainment. The combination of LeBron's global media presence and Warner Brothers' unmatched production and distribution expertise is a big win for fans everywhere. John Barcel, the new deal between LeBron James and WB. Well, I mean, I'm torn on this a little bit. On one hand, it's great business. LeBron James is a global brand now. So if you're Warner Brothers to join up with that, that's great. Just saw Trainwreck, gotta say, I was kind of impressed with LeBron James. But, you know, he's playing a silly version of himself. So it was, it was not exactly acting in the movie, but he was actually quite funny and, and I enjoyed his, his bits and pieces in it. On the other side, I, I'm like, he's a basketball player. He's, he's not an, an actor or a, a media you know, a performer and things like this. So I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. But the one thing I wanted to bring up, though, is this. I first got wind of this story because a lot of people were writing on my Twitter feed, hey, guy, hey, did you hear that LeBron James is going to be in uh, Space Jam 2? 
And that is actually not true. I'm not saying it's not going to be true at some day or it couldn't possibly be true, but uh, there is no mention from LeBron James, from Warner Brothers, or anybody, and nobody's breathing a word about Space Jam 2. Nobody said it's happening. Yes, I know in 2012 LeBron James put out a tweet saying he would love to do a Space Jam 2, but there's nothing to suggest that that's actually happening. But does that mean it can't happen? No, it's Warner Brothers' it's LeBron James and people are asking for Space Jam 2. So, of course, there's a possibility that at this point, disregard anything you're reading about how they're going to make a Space Jam 2. That has actually not been said by anybody yet. But don't fall over in shock if in three days, a week, a month from now, you hear an announcement gets made. Mark, what do you think? Uh, this is awesome. I th I, this is a huge buy for me, especially even if you're a Cavs fan and you're concerned that LeBron might not be focusing on the court. He's totally going to commit to that team, and he still has a lot of good years in his basketball career. But but this is the right time when he's at the peak of his powers. And after that NBA Finals performance, when everybody, even LeBron haters, who previously were like, oh, he just went to Miami to win championships, and he just kind of copped out. Jordan would never just join an all-star team. Even those haters watched LeBron's performance and were like, yeah, you know what? That dude has a lot of heart. So he won over his critics on the court. This is the next move to conquer the world. He's joining forces with Warner Brothers, and I know that it hasn't been confirmed yet, but he's definitely going to be in Space Jam, too, in my opinion. You're not Warner Brothers. You think, you think that's that's a foregone conclusion? I mean, he he ain't going to be in Suicide Squad. <laughs> I mean, he's, I, and but I'd love to see him in Suicide I want to see him in anything. He was he impressed me in Trainwreck, and him in Space Jam, too. It just, I, I was tweeting about this. I tweeted Michael Jordan's reaction to seeing LeBron James in Space Jam 2. I want to see them fight. I want to see, but I don't want to see Mike make a cameo. I want to see them go at it on the court in Space Jam 2. I think it'd be great for his global brand. This is a genius marketing move on both parties' side. Um, I, it's a big buy as long as he doesn't make Shazam 2. Or whatever, Kazam <laughs> 2. Um, so I, uh, yeah, the re I buy this because you strike why the iron is hot. And, mm. and one of the, we were just talking about The Rock. And granted, The Rock had entertainment background working in the WWE but what we forget is one of the main reasons The Rock got that deal was his performance on Saturday Night Live when he right after he was starting his acting career he came out on Saturday Night Live and he crushed it and that's when he started getting all his deals with, with Scorpion King and, and he built his career off that now with LeBron um, he train wreck Everyone's talking about Trainwreck. I agree with you 100%. It's a comedy version of himself, but what it did show is that he was able to do the comedy because you put other guys in there, whether it be a Hulk Hogan or uh, True. Or, or, yeah. or these other athletes. Dan Marino. Like but, right, right. <laughs> but you put these other guys that just don't have that. LeBron showed without a lot, a lot of chops, still could have fun and did his thing, and people were talking about LeBron James in that movie. So you see what he can do. I agree with you. I think Space Jam 2 will probably be the way that you start it, and then... In those movies, those funny, whether it be in the in the television show, whatever it is, start to throw him a little serious scene here and there to see what he can do with drama, and then take that like do what The Rock did, like let it progress because that's what he's going to have to do if he's serious about it. But as far as Warner Brothers inking this guy to a deal, yeah, it's it's a smart move, and just don't I don't need him to come out with an album. I don't need him to do anything. I just want, I want to see him do comedy and, and move on. I'm LeBron James, and these are my favorite Christmas hits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also don't see him starring in everything. Like I don't think he's making himself a movie star. I think no. a lot of this stuff is going to be Yet. producing content and, and being an entertainment mogul as opposed to being a movie star. I don't even think he's going to be somebody like Jim Brown or Alex Karras where they transition into being a full-time actor. I don't think that's ever going to happen with LeBron. I think he's going to be more of a producer, but something like Space Jam too. He's going to be taking on the Monstars. You know what my, my biggest laugh in Trainwreck was? And it, it was a scene without Amy Schumer. I won't spoil it, but it was the scene with Bill Hader oh, yeah. and LeBron James just talking about the lunch bill. Yeah. That, right, that to me, right. that was the funniest scene of the movie to me that I was just like was hysterically off. I thought it was great. He's had these ambitions for a long time. I remember when he had, when he, with the, the Sprite commercials years ago and stuff too. I remember, and that must have been like, what, like 10 years ago or, or whatever it was, people were talking about how he wanted to get into the acting game and do more. And it just took him, like what Mark was saying before, with the focus on basketball and, and getting the titles. And not to say he's going to lose focus on that too, but I think he's matured in general and, know, and his focus, he, he knows that he can say, I'm going after the title, but I'm also going to be able to go after this as well. All right, folks, we've reached that new segment we call Opening This Week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, there are four films opening in a significant number of theaters. A couple of days ago, we covered a couple of them in Pixels and the Vatican Tapes. And today, we got the next two films that are opening this weekend. So, Ashley, what is coming out? 
First up is the new film, Paper Towns. The film is based on the novel by the same name. Author John Green, who also wrote The Fault in Our Stars, and stars Nat Wolf, who starred in The Fault in Our Stars, and Cara Delevingne, who will be appearing in Suicide Squad as the Enchantress. Young and shy Quentin, Nat Wolf, is in for the night of his life when Margot Cara Delevingne, the most popular student in high school, recruits him to help her play mischievous pranks on the friends who betrayed her. The next day, however, the mysterious Margot is nowhere to be found. With help from a few buddies and some cryptic clues that she's left behind, Quentin embarks on an obsessive mission to find the girl who stole his heart and made him feel truly alive. Paper Towns opens on 3,100 screens nationwide. Next up is the new boxing film South Pod, directed by The Equalizer and Olympus Has Fallen director Antoine Fuqua, and stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Rachel McAdams. Billy the Great Hope, Jake Gyllenhaal, the reigning junior middleweight boxing champion, has an impressive career a loving wife and daughter, and a lavish lifestyle. However, when tragedy strikes, Billy hits rock bottom, losing his family, his house, and his manager. He soon finds an unlikely savior in Tick Willis, Force Whitaker, a former fighter who trains the city's toughest amateur boxers. With his future on the line, Hope fights to reclaim the trust of those he loves the most. Southpaw opens on 2,750 screens nationwide. Mark, which of these films are you excited for? I'm excited for both of them, actually, and I've had the pleasure of seeing both of them. If I was going to send uh, the majority of people out there to see one or the other, I don't think you can go wrong either way, to be honest with you. I'd probably say Paper Towns is the safer choice because it's a great coming-of-age story. There's a lot of comedy in there. You get a little bit of that, oh, I remember what it was like to be in high school and to fall in love for the first time and to chase after girls. Southpaw is thick. It is emotional. It is not the easiest watch in the world. The boxing scenes in it are phenomenally done. Some of the best I've ever seen in a film. If you are a boxing fan, if you're a sports movie fan, you should definitely check out Southpaw. There's a lot in there for everybody, but I think the safer play is Paper Towns. Now, I haven't seen either of these films yet, and I am also excited for both of them. I mean, John Green, who wrote uh, Paper Towns and also wrote Fault in Our Stars. Fault in Our Stars was one of those films that really surprised me, I think, because mm-hmm. on the surface, it looks like one of those teeny fluff films, even though it was clearly going to be about some heavy topics. But when you watch the film, there's there's a lot of layers to it, and there's a lot of depth to it, and it was just a really good, engaging, uh, enjoyable film to watch, despite how heavy it was and emotional it gets, too. And when I first saw the trailer for Paper Towns, I remember us talking about it. First 30 seconds of that trailer, I'm like, what a waste of a movie this is going to be. <laughs> and then it kind of changes gears, and all of a sudden, the trailer looked really remarkable, and I was really interested. But the one I'm more interested in is probably Southpaw, if for no other reason than Antoine Fuqua is directing it. I... I, a lot more than most people I acknowledge, I loved Equalizer. I loved what he did with that film. I had a great time with it. And seeing him now work with a talent like Jake Gyllenhaal, some classic story tropes being used here with the boxing realm, stuff like that. I'm excited about seeing them both. If I could only pick one, I personally would probably lean towards Southpaw. I have seen both as well, too. And uh, I agree with Mark that I really enjoyed Paper Towns a lot. Um, And I thought that that the kids' chemistry was amazing. It reminded me of, of Dope, and that also came out earlier this year as in regards to the chemistry with the friends because it had that coming age story and that the way they all interacted and and it was like a road trip movie so right. i had a lot of fun with it but um i would go the other way than mark here and i'd send you to see southpaw because i didn't know what to expect seeing that movie because i thought i saw it all in the trailer and even though i i still think you shouldn't watch the trailer because they give away a really big plot point that i don't think was necessary to show um it was. It's a predictable movie. Did and you it, notice that the second trailer took that they out? They took it out. Yeah. And they should have. It's. It's a. <laughs> listen. It's a predictable movie. It's got a lot of the boxing cliches in it. Um, and I think that if, if people have been comparing to so with Jake Gyllenhaal lately, they want that he's done. He did um, he, the Nightcrawler. He just he did Enemy. So everyone he's changing the game every time. So to see him in this new position, I think people are gonna be like, "Well, that's that's not anything new." I had no problem with that. I thought this movie was engaging. I agree with Mark. The fight scenes are incredible. Um, I was so wrapped up in Rachel McAdams and Jake Gyllenhaal's relationship and the struggle and where it went and the the parallels with Eminem's life. I thought was fascinating as well too. So. Overall, I would send you to see South Bobby and, and don't listen to silly people that just say, well, it's been done before. Go enjoy that movie. Yeah, guess what? Me eating a bowl of vanilla ice cream has been done before, but that doesn't stop me from very much looking forward right. to my next round of doing it again. I'm going to pay to see John Campion eat a bowl. Of- <laughs> Watching this man eat ice cream, is, it's a treat. It is a joy that should be Periscope. Just don't put your hand near it. <laughs> 
All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? Miguel Rivera writes, am I wrong or is DC slash WB setting up a Suicide Squad versus Justice League movie? With Batman and Suicide Squad and the Joker references in Batman versus Superman, do you think this crossover can happen? I haven't heard anyone talk about this, and it's just something I've been thinking about. Can this be true? Is it even possible? Thanks. Love the show. Well, I don't. I, first of all, I think we're phrasing the question wrong because you're asking, can the crossover happen? Well, this is all one shared universe, so it's all... Whether it intends to or not, it's all crossing over. I mean, we already see Batman is going to be in it at some point in some level. But could Warner Brothers be setting up a Justice League versus Suicide Squad movie? I would say no chance. And But the reason I would say no chance is not because I've heard them say they're not going to do it. It's simply because of this. That ain't a fight I want to see. Yeah. Um, Aquaman can take out the entire Suicide Squad. <laughs> Wonder Woman can take out the entire Suicide Squad. Superman will not have much trouble with the entire Suicide Squad. Batman can probably, and I think we're going to see it in Suicide Squad, Batman can probably keep the Suicide Squad in line himself. So having Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman versus a guy who's a really good shot and a guy who throws boomerangs. There's a crocodile, John. And there's, there's a talking there's a killer human, crocodile. Human crocodile. It, that wouldn't be much of a fight. I mean, it just wouldn't. It just wouldn't work. So, no, I don't think they're setting us up. I, think, I do think we're going to see a lot of pollen cross-pollination in all of their properties, and I'm certain that Suicide Squad is not the last time we're going to see members of the Suicide Squad. But are we going to see Justice League versus Suicide Squad? I can't see it happening. Mark, am I wrong? I mean, the Justice League is going to be going after pure evil, you would think, too, after Batman and Superman get over their little tiff eventually. Suicide Squad might have some characters that you're like, well, I mean, the whole premise of Suicide Squad is that there's some really bad people out there. We need to assemble this. This ragtag group of ne'er do wells to go take care of them. The fact that they're both in the same universe, I don't think you're ever going to see them fight because I agree with you. I think it'd be a pretty easy victory for the Justice League. It might be a preseason game, so they can get some backup, some reps, <laughs> but I don't think that's going to ever be a main villain in a film. However, you are going to see elements of Suicide Squad going forward in these Justice League movies. I just don't see them maybe scrimmaging like, you know, seven on seven drills. That's about as far as I can take that. I see. I just love your analogy of a preseason. Let's, yeah, let's send in Kid Flash and Jim. <laughs> Jimmy Olsen <laughs> and Alfred <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to take out Suicide uh, Squad. I think there'll be pains in the asses for the Justice League. Yeah, uh, like here, like and maybe help out some of the other villains. But I think we're going to see in Batman v Superman that we're going to start getting. And this is what Man of Steel did well, and what the universe is going to show. Unlike the Nolan universe, where it was based in realism, this universe is going to start getting more of the supernatural stuff, and and the you know the just the the more of the super villains. So we're going to introduce that as each film progresses. So the, just the normal villains, like you guys said, just it just won't cut it. The other thing that I don't know that maybe you know is timeline-wise. Like, where does the Suicide Squad land? Is that before Batman v Superman? Is that after Batman v Superman? Like, I don't know where that lands. I think Batman v Superman is probably going to give us some insight into that because, so. like, you oh, see yeah. Batman on Joker's yeah. car, and 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 I, I wouldn't think they would do that as a movie that takes place. Before well, we know Batman what happens after Superman, Man Man of Steel because they yeah. mentioned Superman. So I'm just curious as far as where it lands because it's a good question though because Batman wasn't is coming out of retirement to fight right. Superman, so maybe he hadn't retired yet. It's That's a, what I mean. Yeah. So I, but well, but no, it, it, it's a long discussion because again, how well, long clearly Man, it's Man after Man of Steel, right? So so clearly Suicide Squad is after Man of Steel because we hear yeah. Waller mention Superman, right? Right. 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 So right. Batman. We see him in the Suicide Squad, so therefore he's come out of retirement. If Batman versus Superman is where we see Batman coming out of retirement, then it would logically like flow after, that right? Suicide Squad should come after. Unless that's but a who flashback. Knows? Yeah, unless, unless it's a flashback. It's a flashback. Yes, exactly. So, so we don't know. But in in regards to the question, I think that there'll be a lot more the harder villains for those guys to fight, and, and I think we don't want to see them fight. Like, cool. like the Monstars yeah. and LeBron? Right. Monstars. <laughs> Superman, get out of here. <laughs> All right, what's next? Kieran Gleason writes, Hello, Collider Movie Talk crew. Love you all. Is there any news on any kind of 2D animated movies in the coming years, whether it'll be from Disney or DreamWorks or whichever studios or John's artist voice? Is this the end of that form of art? <laughs> Would this generation still be open to seeing 2D animated films or will it be Schnepp's 1940s businessman voice? Meh. 3D <laughs> animated as usual in the motion pictures? Meh. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Um, well, as far as I know, there are no 
two D animated films, uh, major Hollywood films in the works. Now, uh, Ray actually brought to my attention a story where there's a bunch of veteran Disney animators who are getting together to try to bring some sort of it looks like some kind of gothic steampunkish kind of two D animated thing, and I think they're running a Kickstarter of some sort to bring it out. I don't think we've seen the last 2D animated film, but the day of the 2D animated film is gone. Uh, I, I still think we'll see them now and again. I think they'll pop up as, a, as an expressive art form. But I think in many ways you can just do a lot more things with CG animation. There's a lot more you can do. And it is now what this generation of moviegoers is used to seeing. I mean, ever since Toy Story came out 17 years ago, that started a shift in the trend, and now we have a generation of film goers who, when you think animated film, animated film means, you know, CGI. That's what it means. 15 years ago, animated film, if you were going to see a CGI animated film, you would say, it's a CGI animated film. Now today, you just say animated film, and it's the assumption that it's CGI. So I think the day of the 2D animated film is gone, but I don't think that means we'll never see them pop up. But I haven't heard of any that has any plans yet. Christian, have you heard of anything? No, I haven't really heard of much. But it's, you know, it's not just moviegoers, too. It's like, look, like, look at even Netflix here. My, my daughter is three and a half, and she watches the Strawberry Shortcake stuff, right? Right. And I promise I'm talking about my daughter, not Mark Ellis. <laughs> um, so, but she, she watched the first season of it was 2D, and then they, then they switched it come uh, once the second season started. And, I, and I'm wondering that's because even kids, like she watches all these other shows, and the majority of them are all the, the computer animation, very different from the standard, what we, what we used to know when we grew up. But uh, so I just think it's just, you're right, John. It's just, it's just a matter of the way that it is today. And it's, and it's easier, and I assume cheaper, to do. And, and, and time consuming wise, it makes more sense. So I haven't heard about anything in general. You know, I was at home watching Strawberry Shortcake in 3D <laughs> by myself, and I had this revelation that you are still going to see 2D films in theaters, but it's because Disney's classic movies always have anniversaries right. coming up. So yeah. you are going to see The Lion King celebrate its 35th anniversary and Aladdin celebrate anniversaries and have limited runs back in theaters. But even when The Lion King came out a couple years ago and they converted to 3D glasses, but it was still the 2D, I'm watching it, and I love The Lion King. It's one of my favorite films of all time, but it did look dated because... And you're you're selling these films primarily to kids. I know that animated films can appeal to adults just as much as the little kids, but you're selling that movie and you're making money because kids want to go see them over and over again, and it just doesn't catch a kid's eye like I think it used to. So I don't think you're going to see a huge resurgence of it, but... I mean, look at look at the way people appreciate music now. All of a sudden, album players are coming back into style. And, <laughs> and so there is going to be a market for 2D. It's just not going to be the huge blockbuster market like it was. You know, it's going to be really interesting because we just talked the other day about how the Iron Giant is getting re-released. Right. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the reaction to that is. And, and as you point out, it's going to be interesting for me to sit in that theater and, and see, try to put on my objective glasses... Does it feel but, dated? It'll mm -hmm. be interesting. But don't you think though that one it's it's limited to it's like two or three days? Right? It's only a couple days, yeah. So, so because even even so, I think the majority of people for that one um, will be, and we talked about this on the show the other day. It was like the hardcore fans that are really going to see it. I'm wondering how many new fans will go in, and if there's any going to be any demand off of. But I think that most people will be satisfied, even if you're watching it going, ah, oh, this seems a little dated. You're still going to feel those emotions that you felt watching it because it's such a great film. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to change over anybody's perspective from going, oh, maybe the movies need to be made like that again. Yeah, Lion King was number one at the box office when they re-released right. it that weekend, yeah. but I don't think anybody was like, I want to see more 2D movies. Right. I think they just loved The Lion King. Yeah. All right, what's next? Ryan Dubre writes, my question is about the new movie, Before We Go, directed by and starring Chris Evans. I was wondering what your thoughts were about the movie and if you thought Chris Evans might be able to make the transition from actor to actor slash director and become the next Affleck or Eastwood. Again, thanks for all you do. Um, that's, uh, that's a big question. It's like, my, you know, your kid picking up a basketball for the first time saying, can he be the next LeBron or Michael Jordan? Um, no, you can't. Put it down, <laughs> no, go inside. No, you right. can't. Go play piano. 0.5%. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we haven't seen a film directed by Chris Evans yet. And I watched the trailer and look, it's really, really difficult to tell what kind of a job did this director do on this film? based on a trailer. You can get a sense of the story and if the movie's going to be interesting. I'm going to be brutally honest. You all know I'm a huge Chris Evans fan. I, I mean, I, I've talked about the guy a lot. I've talked with the guy a lot. I, think, I think, think he's great and I'm a big fan. The movie feels like a paint-by-numbers indie film to me. I, I watched the trailer and it just feels like 
a paint by numbers, 22 year old college student picking up his buddy's Canon 7D and going out and shooting a little story he wrote over the weekend. It, nothing about the trailer stood out to me as being exceptional in any way. It's going to be one of these VOD release movies. Um, so, but but that's kind of irrelevant. I mean, I, you got to see the movie to really see what did he do as a director in letting the narrative flow and all that kind of stuff. So that you have, we have to wait and see. But since you're asking me the question and all I have to go on is the trailer right now, I would say Chris Evans is not the next Ben Affleck or Clint Eastwood. I don't know, Mark. Well, you clearly think? you've never met a girl and fallen in love on the subway that followed her <laughs> around for the rest of the night and been accused of maybe stalking her a little bit. This movie feels like a fun rom-com to me. It feels like a serendipity. Remember that with John yeah, Cusack and Kate Beckinsale? Yeah. So, and I like fun rom-coms like that. The fact that Chris Evans is directing it, 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 it does make sense in a weird way because it's such a departure from what we know Chris Evans to be already. I'm not going to say the guy's going to be a great director. Like John said, you can put together a good trailer for just about anything. The last Airbender trailer was phenomenal. It's awesome. Yeah. So I'm not going to say he's going to be a great director yet, but I think that this, that him starting out with a small VOD release like this, it shows promise. He's not taking on this huge project and saying, no, I can direct this. He's learning the steps. He's learning the beats of how to be a director. So even though I don't know if this movie's going to be any good, I think it will be. I, he's going about it the right way. I, and, and you know what? Thank you, because I think I need to kind of clarify something that I said, because you raised an excellent point. By me bringing up the fact that it's a VOD release is not in any ways a bad thing at all. I think that is the way you start as a new director, yeah. start with smaller films, VOD films like that. I was just saying the trailer itself didn't impress me, but the fact that it's a VOD should not be considered a bad thing at all. Also realize he has a lot going on right now. Yes, he does. Um, so to take that small film is smart. It also it goes back to the Ant on Fuqua Southpaw conversation before. Yeah, it does look paint by the numbers. But and you also brought up in that same point that it's a matter of what he does as a director. And he was he's directing himself, which could be a daunting task, but it could also be like, I know that I can do that and direct myself and my co-stars here to make this particular story that I want to tell work. And maybe it will feel a little different because of the performances that we bring into it. But we won't know that until we see the film. Right. Um, now, another thing going on, I'm glad he didn't go after an epic film for directing. And I don't know if it was necessarily a debut, but I just watched a water. Diviner recently with Russell Crowe, who directed that right. too. Thought the performance was really good, but the directing was not good at all. I thought it was like overuse of of slow motion, and it was, it was just kind of messy as as a directing piece. So, and that's Russell Crowe. So you could say like if, if someone had brought that question in right away, it's Russell Crowe. So do you think he could be Eastwood or Affleck? We don't know because that same question had that brought up about Affleck. Could he bring the same Eastwood? Ben, the Phantom or Phantoms? I, I, don't, I don't want to see that. <laughs> you were the um, bomb and Phantom. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but the fact that it, what he's done, we won't know until we see like two or three pieces before we know what he can do, and we don't know if he wants to do that. Maybe this is just one particular piece. He should start animating two D films. Bring him back into the. <laughs> yeah. Bring him did, back into the. His project. accent, though, he did pull out a, a lot of that New York accent that he did in the first Captain America. You, you heard, you heard yes, it. Yes, you heard it, it there. It sounded like him a lot. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't pick up on that. I'm not from New York. I don't know. Sleep. Yeah. All right. So that was the last question today. But <laughs> but before we do the sign off here, the four films opening really tonight. Uh, in, in a significant number of theaters. We got Pixels, we got the Vatican tapes, we've got Paper Towns, we got Southpaw. Mark, if you're heading out to the theater tonight, you got to pick one of the four to see which of the four you're going to see. Okay, look, I, I was excited for Pixels. I got to get that out of there. Uh, Vatican tapes don't know enough about. Um, I would, uh, I got to send you to see Paper Towns by a slight edge over Southpaw. It wins in the 12th round. I am probably going to go Paper Towns, or uh, Southpaw. I'm going to go Southpaw. Shabadoo! <laughs> go see Southpaw. <laughs> what about you, Ashley? You had to go to see one of those four films this weekend. Which um, one are you picking to go see? I'm really gonna go against the grain. I'm gonna say the Vatican tapes. I just I love yeah. scary movies, so I'm really excited to see that one. All right. Well, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget. Lots of great films playing in AMC Theaters right now. We just talked about a couple of them. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Don't forget, guys, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on all the shows and programs we do here at Collider Video, and we want you to be a part of the journey with us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? On Twitter, at 5150Ls. If you think LeBron's better than Jordan at acting or basketball, let's have a little battle. And my tour dates are up markellislive.com check me out this fall over here host of jedi council mr christian harloff christian where can people find you on twitter at christian harloff and i've been doing a lot of emojis lately for the FWC screenings <laughs> for the movies so if you want to follow me on instagram at christian harloff but john just mentioned collider jedi council it's back now john got to talk about benicio del toro in the new star wars film mark and i did not john will talk about it again today yes. so make sure you check that out and hashtag collider jedi council so you can get your questions on the air 
And of course, our lovely host over here, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Thursday, guys. And of course, you can find me on the various social media networks just at John Campia. That'll do for us, guys. For Collider Video, my name's John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye.